I was uh, backstage the whole time trying to remember how many uh, methylene groups there are between the phosphorus and the nitrogen and glyphosate. <laughs> There's one. I'm very, very thankful to have the chance to talk to you today about something that's very, very close to my heart. It's the reason why I'm speaking to you today, I think the reason why I was chosen to give this talk is because I've made a career of learning and I kind of want to pass on some of the things that I've learned about that, uh, no pun intended, uh, to you. Next slide. I have a little outline here. We're going to talk a little bit about what learning actually is, uh, what the literature tells us it is, especially when it comes to behavioral science. We're going to talk a little bit about some lies you've been told, probably since you were very, very young, and then maybe spin that around. Let's not do the negative, let's end on the positive and talk about what some good learning um, um, strategies would look like. Um, we'll call them uh, characteristics. And uh, we're going to talk a lot, uh, like many of our speakers actually have tonight, about metacognition. So metacognition is when you think about the way that you're thinking. It's very, very important that you think about what you're thinking. Even if you have to take a little bit of a break, stare at a blank wall, as I sometimes say, sip a cup of hot tea, and actually think about what's going through your brain at that moment. It's really, really important. Next slide. So what is learning? Research shows that most learning takes place outside the classroom. Well, that's pretty good, since I'm a teacher. It's always good to read that in the literature. But it's true. Learning is highly emotional. Everybody remembers the fishing trip with grandma, or like cooking cookies with grandpa, or something like that. And no one ever remembers how many methylene groups there are between the phosphorus and the nitrogen in the structure of glyphosate, right? It also needs struggle. This is very, very important, because you get a lot of students and a lot of teachers that talk, and they say, oh, the most important part about my education was that flash. And I woke up one day, and then I just remembered everything about dimensional analysis, and I could do it in my sleep. That's not actually what learning is, at least not what the literature is telling us. The literature is telling us it's more of a gradual awakening. A couple steps every day, a couple steps every week, a couple steps every month. Think, like it's hard to when you're a young person, several years or decades hence. What else is learning? Students who've actually been taught how to learn. You have to think about that for one second. So let's all metacognate just for a couple seconds. Students who are taught how to learn perform better and retain better information. And most important of all, especially for someone who teaches everybody's favorite subject, organic chemistry, very early in the morning, a couple days of the week, you have a healthier attitude towards your own education. Learning how to learn is a significant investment. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of patience, but it pays off for people who actually engage it, hopefully making things worthwhile. So my wife is a historian, and a number of years ago she introduced me to James Lowen's books. If you haven't read them, you definitely have to pick them up. So James Lowen explores all the things you've been told about American history that basically is straight up lies. And his books are very, very popular, New York Times bestseller in the national thing. What I decided to do is take a little bit of a spin and talk about some things that you've been lied to when it comes to the idea of learning. Learning is not fast. Learning takes a very, very, very long time. I'm in my mid-40s, and there's things on a near daily basis that I am still learning. And if at any moment, you, as one of my students, or someone who sees me around Detroit Mercy, sees me and says, that guy's got it together, you couldn't be more wrong, because every single morning I have to do the same thing you have to do. Look in the mirror and decide to follow through and go to work that day. And if you're lucky, you choose a career where you don't have to work too hard to make that decision. Learning is very, very gradual. Knowledge is isolated facts. Oh, well, I needed to know this for this class. I needed to know this to change the tire of my car. I needed to know this. No way. Everything is interconnected. Just start telling stories. That's how, you know, you could memorize something by making up a song about it. Or go in lots of different directions. Connect things. Realize that there's lots of overlap in everything that you're learning. Expertise is inborn rather than the result of hard work. We heard in Sean's talk about what's called the growth mindset. Very, very important. Every once in a while, we go into our dark place. I'm just not good enough called the imposter syndrome. It actually has a name in the psychological literature. 
If you don't experience that on a daily basis, I'm not convinced that you're an adult in the Western culture world at this point, okay? Everybody's better than me. Everybody's got it together. I have no idea what I'm doing. That is a very, very normal response. But it is not because someone woke up one day and figured everything out. Mostly it's because they had an attitude towards what they wanted to change that we call the growth mindset. Multitasking is the path to balance. Ugh. This is the one that I struggle with the most. When I read the theory paper, it was only two years ago, on inattentional blindness, honestly, I almost started to cry. This paper basically said, do you realize that saying yes to everything and being busy all the time is the ultimate form of being lazy? Because you're not getting anything done. And I pretty much do that on a daily basis. I struggle to this day to try to figure out how to manage every part of my life, and it's tough. Inattentional blindness refers to the things that we don't think about that are affecting us and things that we think are affecting us, but they're not, right? Learning is tidy and methodical. Number one, if you have never been at a table or a desk with paper strewn all over the place, maybe an organic model kit, who knows what, obviously uh, your generation, we're gonna, deciding we're going to call you the plurals. No more than five screens in front of you at all times, right? <laughs> Phone, tablet, laptop, video game, TV at all times. These are my kids, basically, my biological children that I'm trying to raise. Learning is very, very messy. <laughs> Learning is very, very messy. It takes a lot of work to get it right. And when someone tells you, oh, everything just clicks, it's easy. Just do this problem and you'll be fine. Then they're telling you a lie. And I think that there's a better way to look at stuff. Let's talk about what good learners do. Because the number one thing on this list is something that's very, forgive me, elemental. And that's being curious. I was just invited the other day to sit at the table with some of the big dogs at the university. And I was embarrassing myself inside my own head. Why am I here? I don't belong here. I'm just the organic chem prop. Everybody thinks I'm a young guy, even though actually I've been around at the university for almost two decades. And maybe that's a blessing, maybe it's a curse. But I remember being really small and always being curious about everything. And that really is the place to start. I think I saw a cartoon a couple years ago online that showed these wild little kids going into a school. And then the second panel was they were walking out all dressed in business suits, all exactly the same height, dressed the same, same colors, and all going together. And it just broke my heart. You have to be curious to be a learner. If there's a way you could get back that way you felt four, five, six years old when you learned about something for the first time. I don't care whether you were memorizing dinosaur names or Pokemon, it still counts as far as I'm concerned. Good learners pursue understanding diligently. It takes a lot of work to be able to learn. And you have to understand that you gotta go at it forever. And frankly, I'm getting kind of sick and tired of never give up. Everybody says that. Actually, I think you have to know when to give up. Because if you don't, then you're never going to be able to decide what's important to you. Recognize that some learning is not fun. A lot of learning is not fun, okay? A lot of it. And the man is going to constantly put blocks in front of you that you have to jump over. Here's my career in a nutshell. Okay, survived grade school, that's nine years in one place. Up, oh, you're a freshman all over again. Now you're in high school. You're a senior, up, oh, a few weeks later, you're a freshman all over again. Now you're in college, up, oh, you're a first year grad student, so you're still a peon. Graduate with my PhD, up, oh, you're a junior faculty member. You still can't sit at the big, over and over and over and over again. Really wears you down, really wears you down. A lot of it is not fun, but that's okay, because there is a special thrill when it works. Good learners utilize failure positively. We heard a lot about failure in Sean's talk. I thought that was great. Utilizing failure because it happens to all of us on a daily basis. I'm a big fan of the philosophical method called epistemology, which refers to how knowledge is made. You have to make your own knowledge to make it work. You can't just have someone give something to you. Don't worry, Prof Mayo, I watched a video of your lecture. I'm good to go. But did you make the knowledge yourself? Did you rewrite it? Did you write it the way you want to see it? Did you make a table? Did you think about it actively? That's what it takes to really get down and dirty with epistemology. Or you could take Professor Kogel's epistemology class. That would work too. Never run out of questions. Sometimes it breaks my heart to say, we've got to move on, guys. If it was my 
uh, you know, world, I would talk for five minutes in lecture and just allow you the following 70 minutes to just keep asking questions because it's the only way that you can actually get really, really good at something. And probably most important of all, that's why it's last on the list, you got to share what you've learned. Even if sometimes people aren't willing to listen to you, sooner or later they'll get used to the way that you teach and that's really the best way to do it. We hear all the time when we're in the academy, oh, you really don't learn stuff until you teach it. And so I tell my students, and when they ask me, what's the best way to get ready for this exam? Well, if I were you, I would pretend like you were me, write a full-length exam, and trade it with your buddy. Because that's really the only way you're going to be able to get ready for the way that I'm thinking about it. Why is all this important? So this article right here in the Journal of College Science Teaching was in a box that I had to move out of my office the day that I moved into Detroit Mercy. And it showed this classic image from the 19 teens, so 100 years ago, called The Maiden and the Witch. Do you see the young woman looking away, or do you see the old crone? Ooh. This article knocked my socks off minutes into the start of my career. This article is about education's ability to do harm. This article started with, hey buddy, how did you get over your undergrad education? And the other person's like, what? What do you mean? Well, it took me like five years to get over the cycle of study, <coughs> divest the knowledge, get some extra sleep, eat again, study, divest the knowledge over and over and over and over and over. And many of you are in this room and you're going to do it over and over and over. And then you're going to go to med school and you're going to do it for four more years. And then you're going to get a fellowship and do it for eight more years. And when does it end? And this article ends with, boom, how are you going to get over your undergraduate education? Is it the maiden or the witch? Can it help or can it harm? Here's my attitude. When I see this quote from P.J., he's a classic psychologist, I think really, really hard about who's to blame. And maybe that is a little bit of a sour note to end on. But I tend to take the blame to myself. Good leaders always take way less of the credit than they're due and way more of the blame. And if I'm the captain of my classroom, I have to think very, very hard about how to teach my students how to learn the material. Not just the material but to teach them how to learn it. And until you really get to the point where you're learning how to learn, there may be something you're missing. I think it's important to look at this from the perspective of the real differences that we have with information flowing as fast as it is now. There isn't just a step up to learning something. You may have to unlearn something you already know. And if you don't know how to learn, or you haven't learned how to learn, that could be big trouble. I really appreciate the chance to talk to you all today. Thanks.